Hello again. In 1947, a war crimes trial was being held in Nuremberg. SS Lieutenant General Oswald Pohl and 17 of his subordinates were charged with using slave labour in the concentration camps, factories and mines of the Third Reich. Article 6 of the International Military Tribunal had defined slave labour as a crime against humanity. Pohl and three others were hanged for the exploitation of slave labour. It's strange because Britain at that time had 400,000 slave labourers. A quarter of the land force in the country was slave labour. Using prisoners of war as slave labour has always been frowned upon. One recalls the indignation that the British felt about uh, the people, their prisoners, forced by the Japanese to build a railway in South Asia. The story told, of course, in the film The Bridge on the River Kwai. It's not necessary to travel to Thailand to see a transport link built by slave labour. One only needs to take a tube train to Debden, which is on the outskirts of London, and then a five minute walk will take you to Rectory Lane, which was also constructed by slave labour. Prisoners who were held in a camp in the heart of Epping Forest and marched out under armed guard each day to build roads. This is Rectory Lane. The fighting in Europe, which was the major part of the Second World War, came to an end in the spring of 1945 and it ended in the unconditional surrender of Germany. No armistice was signed or peace treaty arranged and the implications of this were a little staggering. It meant for one thing that the war with Germany did not officially end in 1945. The formal end of the Second World War and final arrangement for all outstanding matters was not settled until the signing on the March, March 15th 1991 of the Treaty for the Final Settlement with respect to Germany. Before this time, there had been no one leader of Germany capable of making any sort of settlement with the Allies. This may sound a bit of a minor quibble, but it was a mechanism by which Britain was able to remove protection from German prisoners and then exploit them as slave labour. The Geneva Convention to which, of course, Britain was a signatory, offers protection for prisoners of war. You can't force them to undertake unpaid labour. You have to feed them at least as well as your own soldiers and they have to be housed as well as your own troops. When the fighting's over, of course, they have to be repatriated to their own country. After the fighting had ended in 1945, the British wanted as many workers as they could get their hands on who wouldn't have to be paid and could be locked up in uh, cheap primitive conditions and then forced to build houses, construct roads, bring in the harvest and so on. To give one example, before the war, one and a half million acres of wheat cultivated in this country. During the war that was doubled by 1945, there were 3 million acres of wheat under cultivation. Previously, this had been harvested by the Women's Land Army, uh, conscientious objectors, volunteers and so on. That all came to an end in 1945. A huge labour force was now needed. A very cunning trick was now played. According to the letter of the law of the Geneva Convention, Prisoners of war are those captured during fighting. If a soldier surrenders, he's not technically a prisoner of war at all. Since most of the German soldiers were in uniform, the war ended, surrendered and hadn't been captured, they needn't be classified as prisoners of war. An awful lot of those were already in prison camps in Britain and Canada and America had also surrendered. So it was possible to argue that they weren't really prisoners of war after all. What the British then did was to reclassify all the German soldiers that they had in their 
possession and was able to gather up across Europe in the aftermath of the fighting and reclassify them as surrendered enemy personnel. And then at a stroke removed all protection of the Geneva Convention from the prisoners. Having done so, they were all transported to Britain and set to work, something which would have been quite unlawful had they been prisoners of war. Under the Geneva Convention, had these men been prisoners of war, Britain would have been obliged to repatriate them to send them back to Germany. As it was though, they began scouring Germany and the rest of Europe for any soldiers they could find and shipping them back against their will to Britain, where they were held in camps and set to work. The conditions in the camps themselves would have violated the Geneva Convention as well. During the bitter winter of 1945, many of the men were held in tents. There weren't enough huts for them. Even the camps which had huts were fairly grim and looked very much like concentration camps. Here's one of the uh, slave labour camps which was guarded by the army at that time. Many people find it hard to believe that years after the war had ended the British army was still seizing Germans and bringing them back to Britain as slave labour. But we only have to look at the figures to see that. In May 1946, a year after the war had ended, there were 373,000 German prisoners in Britain. The following month, the number had risen to 385,000. In other words, a year after the German surrender, we were still importing 3,000 men a week from Europe, Germans, to do our work for us. Of course, the slave labourers in Britain were not being brutally mistreated or worked to death, but that's got nothing to do with it. They were being held behind barbed wire in camps under armed guard and forced to work for nothing. If we look at the judgment at Nuremberg during the so-called slave labour trial there, which, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, consisted of Lieutenant General Oswald Pohl of the SS and 17 of his subordinates, the argument there, the defence of those Nazis, was that the prisoners had been kept in reasonable conditions, certainly no worse than those of the Germans themselves, and that they were humanely treated and adequately fed. Right, dismissing this defence, the judge said, and this is uh, Judge Robert Toms of the Circuit Court of Michigan, who was presiding over that particular Nuremberg trial, he said, under the spell of National Socialism, these defendants today are only mildly conscious of any guilt in the kidnapping and enslavement of millions of citizens, civilians. The concept that slavery is criminal per se does not enter into their thinking. Their attitude may be summarised thus. We fed, clothed and housed these prisoners as best we could. If they were hungry and cold, so were the Germans. If they had to work long hours under trying conditions, so did the Germans. What is wrong with that? Then he went on to say, slavery may exist even without torture. Slaves may be well fed and well clothed and comfortably housed, but they are still slaves if without lawful process they are deprived of their freedom by forceful restraint. The fact of slavery is a compulsory, uncompensated labour. There's no such thing as benevolent slavery. Involuntary servitude, even tempered by humane treatment, is still slavery. That judgment was delivered in 1947 and resulted in four men being hanged at a time when the British had 400,000 such labourers in their country, 25% of the entire land force. The last of the German labourers was finally freed in 1948. What had happened in those three years was, under international law, a crime against humanity. <laughs>